Hi guys, this is Scott Campbell. Um, I am so heartbroken that I'm sending you this and I'm not there in person, but my, my wife's water just broke and um, we, uh, it's the next 24 hours are gonna be interesting. But I really wish I could be there. Doing a TED Talk is a dream of mine for a long time. Everyone asked me to draw pictures, nobody wants to hear what I have to say. But um, I'm sorry I can't be there. I'm gonna send a video that we shot while rehearsing yesterday, and hopefully that does it for you. Thanks, guys. We'll do that right there. So, I was one of these countless kids in the 80s that was diagnosed with attention deficit disorder. Now I have my own opinions as to whether or not it should even be considered a deficit or a disorder. Uh, I won't get into that here, but I will say that the Texas public school system I went through was not a hospitable environment for anyone who's more comfortable with creative, abstract thought than they are with linear, rational thought. Because of that, my academic career was challenging to say the least. I barely got through in most of my classes. The only, the only time I really did well was when I was taking tests because when I was taking a test, there'd be a clock ticking. There'd be a performance pressure, and, and that pressure created a sense of crisis. And I really needed a sense of crisis in order to stay focused on anything for any length of time. In high school, I realized I had a, a knack for drawing. I, I still managed to fail art class, though, because I, even then I couldn't ever finish any drawings. Each attempt would, would go the same way. I'd, I'd have an idea about something, and I'd, I'd be passionate about the idea to the point where I, I couldn't think about anything else. I had to get to a piece of paper and pencil as quickly as I could. And I'd start drawing, convinced that what I was about to make would be so great, it would revolutionize the concept of drawing for the rest of time. And then, flash to 20 minutes later, I'd be frustrated, disheartened, and just not interested, you know, because what was happening on the paper was slightly different than what I had originally envisioned. And so I'd crumple it all up and I'd start over again, and again and again, and nothing ever got finished. I was also a pretty unattractive child. Uh, a lot of people had a difficult time figuring out if I was even a boy or a girl. And that didn't help my romantic life much. Um, but of the few people that did happen to guess correctly as to my gender, um, none of them wanted to make out with a pudgy little boy girl. Things, things started to get a little bit better in my 20s when, when puberty finally let go of me. And I did convince a couple girls into hanging out with me in public. And often, those relationships went similar to my drawings. I would have an idea about a person. I'd meet them and I'd, I'd project this whole life together and, and I'd, I'd get them in front of me and a couple weeks later, I would realize that the person that is actually there is not the one I imagined them to be. And so I'd crumple it all up and start over again. So I dropped out of school and ran away to San Francisco. I ended up falling in with this little crew of punk rock hippies living in Golden Gate Park. I spent a lot of my time just drawing on jean jackets. Like I'd get jean jackets from some of the other kids and I'd draw band logos or album covers on the back and in exchange they'd kick me a couple bucks or buy me dinner. But it didn't take that long for me to transition from drawing on jackets to actually trying to carve these pictures into their arms and legs. Needless to say, my first couple dozen attempts were horrible. But I remember distinctly, I got together seven photos of my least horrible attempts and I took them to this grimy, just smoky biker tattoo shop. I walked in, I laid my seven photos out on the counter and I explained to them that I was an incredibly experienced tattoo artist. I had just moved there from Texas and damn it if the airline didn't lose my luggage and all I had to prove this story was these seven photos. Fortunately, the airline luggage story also helped explain why I hadn't changed my clothes in a week. But much to my surprise, they hired me. 
and I started the next day as a professional tattoo artist. I did learn later on that their quality control was lapse because they made most of their money selling meth out of the back door. But at the time, I, I didn't care. I, all I wanted to do was draw pictures and make enough money to feed myself. About my first 300 tattoos at the tattoo shop, they all started out the same way my childhood drawing did. I'd sketch out this idea on some dirtbag's arm and I'd be so excited about it. I'd dive into tattooing it with all the optimism in the world, certain that nothing could go wrong. And then, 20 minutes later, I'd be freaking out. I'd be having an internal panic attack while trying to keep the customer from noticing that everything was going wrong. Like the lines were not the way I had initially envisioned them. I didn't know how I was gonna shade it now. I, I, the whole thing just felt overwhelming and out of control. But unlike drawing on paper, I couldn't just turn the page and start over again. I had to see this thing through for better or for worse. The imminent possibility of getting my teeth kicked in by a disgruntled customer created that sense of crisis that I needed in order to stay focused. So I finally found a scenario where I could handcuff myself to an idea and follow it through to completion every time. And every time I did that, I would wipe away the blood and the ink from the tattoo and I'd, I'd look at it and realize it's great. It's not my original idea, but it's better than an idea because it's not just an idea. It's a real thing. And when you look at it, I can feel all those decisions and course corrections that I made along the way. And it took me going through that excruciating process literally thousands of times before I had the confidence to take a similar leap in other mediums, um, love included. I feel incredibly lucky that I found tattooing. I mean, since starting at that little grimy tattoo shop, I've tattooed the whole spectrum of humanity. Literally, I've tattooed biker gang members who are professional hitmen. I've tattooed Jennifer Aniston and everything in between. Even outside of tattooing, I've gotten to collaborate with Marc Jacobs, uh, Louis Vuitton, Nike, Apple, and a whole bunch of other kind of creative forces who I'd, I still don't know how they got my phone number. But after sitting down with thousands of these clients, tattooing them and, and basically listening to who they are in their life and what they're going through and helping them figure out what sort of symbols or phrases or imagery make them feel more like themselves, I've definitely picked up a couple patterns and, and learned a few things. Anything worthwhile has to be earned. You know, when I first started painting, I was really desperate to figure out my thing. I, I, you know, in the same way that Jackson Pollock made his little squiggles and MC Escher did his crazy stares going everywhere, I was like, I really wanted to find my thing and, or my trick and start putting things out there in the world. But, you know, I realized that there's, you don't find a thing. Your thing comes when you just get your hands dirty and start making stuff. And everything you learn along the way, that's your thing. And with relationships, it's the same way. I feel like I've met so many people who have this idea of finding love. Like they're really hoping to find love. You don't find love. Nobody finds love. Love is something you have to build. The best thing you can do, if you're lucky, is find someone that is a willing collaborator with which to build a love. A flawed something is so much better than a perfect nothing. You know, in my tattoos or in any artwork I make really, my favorite things when I look back on it are all the little mistakes. You know, the unexpected things that happened that I had to adjust to. And in relationships, that's the, that's the same way. It's the good stuff. You know, we, of course, initially we have this crush and we have this idea of who a person is and, and that excitement is what gets us in there to get our hands dirty. But Eventually, you get to the point where you realize that that happily ever after you imagined is not what's in front of you. What's in front of you is just a pile of a human mess. But 
that human mess is so much more real and it's so much more fun and I feel like the success of a love is not necessarily how long it lasts, whether it's two weeks or 20 years. The success of a love is, is based on how profoundly you can appreciate the person in front of you as they are and not how you imagine they might be. Strength can be a weakness. Uh, granted, I've spent too much time in tattoo shops around a bunch of tough guys, but I feel like I run into so many people who put forth this facade of, of stoicism and then get frustrated when they don't meet anyone who just miraculously understands all of the stirrings inside them. You know, they, they keep their poker face on, but, but then they expect people to just be sensitive to everything that's happening. But stoicism is not strength. Strength is being able to be honest with yourself about who you are and present that to someone without being afraid of how they might receive you. So with making art and love and really anything once you step back from it all, there's nothing to lose. Every now and then, we get people coming into the tattoo shop wanting to get their boyfriend's or girlfriend's names tattooed on them. And I feel like in most tattoo shops, they all have a, their own version of a disclaimer that they give in that scenario. It's, are you sure this is the one? Have you been together at least a year? You know this is permanent, right? I say, fuck it. If you love someone today, love them with everything you have. Like, pull no punches. Because, yes, statistically, the odds are stacked against you that you'll be together forever. But, you know, a failed attempt at love is nothing to be ashamed of. I feel like it's so much less tragic to have a couple ex-girlfriends or ex-boyfriends' names tattooed on you than it is to find yourself in the later years of life having never known what it feels like to really give yourself to something. <laughs> 